Andrew Thomas, an Historia and History and Philosophy lecture for my History and Philosophy group on the second year of high school in Norway, uh, weeks 9 and 10. This week, uh, one episode only, uh, the lecture will be given in English. And we've gone into a new chapter of the syllabus, which is about recent history and critical thought. Uh, and political theory is quite central to this chapter, so I thought I would um, start off with a lecture about John Stuart Mill, because the two main political theories that we'll be studying are basically communism and liberalism. And John Stuart Mill wrote the uh, the classical work in uh, the classic work in uh, liberal political theory. So we'll be looking a little bit at his utilitarianism because it's relevant for ethical philosophy, but we'll be going fairly quickly over to his political theory. Um, utilitarianism is is what he's most known for, and it's his um, it's his godfather actually, Jeremy Bentham, who kind of founded the movement. Uh, it's the big alternative to Kant's ethical theory in 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 moral philosophy in general. It has to be said, um, but um. But in particular, in the 1800s, those are the two um, games on the horizon. In the, in the 1900s, um, virtue theory, Aristotle's virtue theory, really um, takes the field back in a big way. Anyway, um, utilitarianism, yes, it's an ethical uh, theory, it's, it's moral philosophy. But it's also a big social movement, and it's kind of the last, the dying... Um, the death throes of the um, of the police of the police science of the Enlightenment, what in German would be called Polizeiwissenschaft, um, which is a way of getting together a an ethical and an effective and a good population. Um, it's most famous uh, for uh, in in France in the Enlightenment period. Um, and it's a guy called De La Mer who wrote the, the the central work. The point is, it's it's about a social it's about social technician, and social technology. You could go, uh, you could easily say it's about institutions. Um, it's about getting people to be good. Uh, basically, about forming um, the formation of ethical citizens. The um, the one of the big contributions of utilitarianism in addition to the the ethical theory is um, is Jeremy Bentham's ideas about legal systems and Jeremy Bentham also designed a, a model prison and you can see an example of the model prison in um, in the old town in Frederickstar which is has got a, a big watchtower in the middle and it's surrounded by um, cells with great big windows so that you can always be seen so that you always act like you're being watched Anyway, basically the theory of utilitarianism, I mean, there's one sentence you really need to say whenever you are asked about utilitarianism, and that is the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, utilitarianism basically says that all moral theory is based on the idea that you choose the option of, um, of whereby your actions will result in the greatest good for the greatest number. Largest number of people who are happy. That's what you're going for. Most pleasure, least pain. Um, and I gave you an example of this um, when we talked about Immanuel Kant's ethical theory, um, because in the film Speed, when Sandra Bullock is faced with the with the option of killing a mother and child or killing everybody on the bus, she sacrifices, or she would have sacrificed if there if it really was a mother and child, um, the, just the two people in order to save the large number of people on the bus, because more people saved seems to be the moral choice. The other famous film moment which illustrates uh, utilitarianism as an ethical theory is um, is at the end of Star Trek II, and I'm sure everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, Dr. Spock in Star Trek is about to die, um, and he dies in order to save the entire ship. I really don't remember anymore exactly why this is the case. The point is... Captain James D. Kirk tries to save him, and Dr. Spock doesn't allow him because, and his dying words are, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one. So that's the point in utilitarianism. You save many people, sometimes you'll have to make self-sacrifice, but then it's a good self-sacrifice, assuming you save a lot of people. Now, it's basically a, a mathematical system, 
Um, you're looking at the results of your actions and you weigh them up and you find out what weighs most. Uh, M John Stuart Mill's contribution to this, because Jeremy Bentham had already sorted out the mathematical system and he'd even made an elaborate calculus to find out what was best, you know, what lasts longest, what is most intense, what is most sure, what, it, what leads to more happiness after that. But um, John Stuart Mill's modification is that if you ask all the people who have experienced all kinds of pleasure, they will always choose philosophy and intellectual pursuits over, uh, for example, drinking, having sex, um, sleeping, whatever. So for him, it's the intellectual pursuits that are best. So the greatest pleasure for the greatest number and preferably intellectual pleasure. Reading a novel rather than eating a steak. That's the idea. So, for John Stuart Mill, it is better to be a dissatisfied Socrates than a satisfied pig. It's better to be somebody who is going for intellectual pursuits, maybe doesn't get all of them, but at least goes for them. Uh, much better than all the physical pleasures. Um, a, a pig who's just lying in the pigsty, well-fed, fast asleep. It's better to be the dissatisfied Socrates than that satisfied pig. It's a choice, and John Stuart Mill says, if you ask lots of people, then they'll tell you. Okay, it's important that we distinguish between John Stuart Mill's approach and Immanuel Kant's approach here. Immanuel Kant took a very logical approach. He wanted to say, okay, what is um, ethics? It's all about choice. You have to choose choice. Uh, you've got to choose rational actions so you can't sacrifice people. You've always got to... You remember the other way, and you can look at the other lecture in order to revise that. John Stuart Mill is empirical here. He says, ask everybody. If you want to find out what gives most pleasure, ask everybody. And this is very much um, a part of the 1800s, which is the, the time at which people were starting to um, to map populations. Sociology was just kicking off. Um, there's a there's a um, an emerging social anthropological movement. Um, so we're looking at people. And he says, just ask lots of people and you'll find out what makes everybody happy. Intellectual pleasure. The other thing is for Kant, you can find a good action. It's an action which is good as such as that action. Whereas for John Stuart Mill, actions are only good by virtue of what they lead to. So we would call them a consequentialist or a teleological um, ethical theory. Okay, so that's the ethical theory. Let's just move on into the political theory as soon as possible. The classic of uh, liberal political theory is called On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. It's, it's actually quite a short book, so it's well worth reading. You can, um, you can download it in English. Uh, from, from I've got a uh, reference at the end of this um, film. So, um, and it's particularly a good theory because you can state its thesis really quickly, <laughs> really easy. Uh, and it's this expression here, no political intervention. Um, political theory is all very well, says uh, John Stuart Mill, but we find we're always having to defend ourselves against our political leaders. It's not just each other that we have to defend ourselves against. We're always have to, having to defend ourselves against political leaders, people who have authority over us. All the way from ancient Greece and, and demo, demagogues in, in democratic um, Athens, or the, um, or the oligarchs in Sparta, all the way to modern France, and either the political leaders wielding the guillotine or the um, the emperor Napoleon that came after them. It's it's polit politicians that are, are the problem. So when we're trying to um, when we're trying to have a good political theory what we need to do is not just say what is good and legal politics um, we need to um, find out what is the limit of political action. And basically the answer to this question is no political intervention unless it is justified. And the only reason you should be able to, you can justify political intervention, according to John Stuart Mill, is if you're going to prevent other people from being hurt. So you're going to um, prevent, if you can intervene politically in order to stop somebody from killing somebody else. So that kind of thing, stop someone from injuring someone else. And that is justifiable political in intervention. And here we're thinking about especially punishment. For John Stuart Mill, punishment is just, it's okay. It's always okay. He's got some interesting views about capital punishment, for example. 
um, which as a utilitarian, you can't really justify killing somebody as a punishment. It can't lead to that person being happy. But for John Stuart Mill, if the alternative is keeping them in a lifetime of imprisonment, then, well, for God's sake, kill them. Keeping them in a lifetime of imprisonment is, is the worst possible option. Um, and if you can't let them live because they're just too hung, um, too dangerous, then, um, then then kill them. Um, so so that is the um, ultimate political justification. Remember, and you can this this is very familiar from previous um, British political philosophy that we've uh, talked about. Remember, um, Thomas Hobbes. Um, founded his entire political theory basically on the idea that everybody has this sovereign right to defend themselves um, but when they delegate that right to defend themselves to a political leader then that is the founding act of politics so defending yourself preventing hurt to others is the key uh, it justifies all politics and the other instances he says well but of course there is natural a kind of natural political authority over people who are unable to take care of themselves. Um, and, and, and John Locke would probably say that well, that's not really political authority, um, but, the, but John Stuart Mill at least says it's, it's, it's power. You are allowed to use power over other people in these instances. Um, and, and yeah, and he quotes three, and they're very interest, three very interesting ones. Children, we have to remember that this is the period when the first big schools are being set up. The MAD, um, this is the, the, the first asylum was set up in the 1790s, so only um, five decades before he was writing this book. And the uncivilized, bear in mind this is also the, the big colonial era, era. And John Stuart Mill, this isn't his last word on colonialism, um, but yeah, he is a child of his time, and um, and he thinks that basically you need to civilize people. What he was really controversial about was that he says once these people are civilized, once uh, once there is dem democracy in the in the colonies, um, then then colonialism is wrong, and he would be unusual amongst uh, amongst British people in 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 the eighteen fifties or the eighteen forties um, by saying, um, well, colonialism needs to stop as soon as people are actually civilized. But of course, he's also being completely naive and short-sighted in saying that there is no civilization outside British colonialism. And, and that is a deep, deeply problematic thing. But, but of course, John Stuart Mill would have been in favor of the American Revolution, in favor. Okay, so that's the, um, the main theory in, um, in On Liberty. Uh, let's look at some of the background here. The 1800s, um, we've talked about all sorts of... Um, of developments of democracy and obviously we the, the story started with Solon's reforms in Athens um, and the Enlightenment has very much been a, a, a time of demo democratic reform but I, for my money it's the 1800s it's after the Enlightenment that we really see the great age of democratic reform um, it's 1814 was an important time for for Norway for example but it's really only at the end of the century in 1898 for example that everybody gets the um, the vote, and similarly in um, in most European countries, uh, there was um, there was a great deal of um, political reform in the eighteen hundreds. Um, we also have the French Revolution in the background, so you can see that John Stuart Mill is, is is worried that the French Revolution led to a tyranny of the few. It led to uh, yes, it was a fantastic um, democratic reform. It was also uh, soon turned into a bloodbath for a great number of people because it was a time of um, it was a time of suspicion. It was a time of um, of anxiety about that the king was going to. Um, that the that a royal was going to return, that the aristocracy would take um, power back. So it was it was a bloody bloody time, and you can see the anxiety of great uh, of British people worrying about the French Revolution in in a, a large variety of, of writings at the time, especially um, Burke's um, work on on the French Revolution, Ed, Edmund Burke, but also Charles Dickens's book, um, the, the most famous being the the Tale of Two Cities. Um. So you have to remember that there is political reform going on, and it's talking about public opinion. And this is one word that's, that comes back again and again in this book on liberty, it's public opinion. John Stuart Mill is saying, yes, it's political um, intervention has to be stopped, but it, we, we must 
We mustn't be ruled by public opinion either. We should be free from public opinion. We should live our own lives. We should have our, our own um, sphere of influence, our sphere of action, and it shouldn't be, uh, people shouldn't be allowed to dominate each other. Um, so we've got the French Revolution, we've got um, British political reform, we've got the revolutions of 1848, which is called the Spring Revolutions, the, the Arabic Spring that, we have, uh, that we've been having, Arabic Spring, as we could um, almost say, uh, that we've been having in the past couple of years. Um, have, um, that was a, a, a reference to the Spring Revolutions of 1848, when people all over Europe uh, rose up and insisted on getting the... Um, the vote, the big movement in Britain was called the was called Chartism, and people and, and and people were willing to stand up and 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 riot in order to um, get the things that Chartism was was fighting for. And it was there was a genuine atmosphere of fear in the 30s and 40s in Britain that at any moment people could just get up and start destroying stuff. Um, the 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 demands of Chartism, just so you know a little bit about how. Um, how f how Britain wasn't especially democratic in the 1830s and 1840s, um, in spite of the Glorious Revolution, um, is that they were demanding for a vote for every man over the age of 21. That was not in place. Now, I don't think that was in place in Norway either. They were uh, arguing for a secret ballot so that people couldn't be influenced. Um, they were arg arguing for no property qualification for members of parliament. In order to be a member of parliament until that time, you had to own a particular amount of property. They were arguing that politicians should have to be paid so that you didn't have to be so that you wouldn't just have rich people in parliament and constitu constituencies of equal size, which which means that um, people who had members of parliament and government would represent the same number of people. Until this time, um, Manchester, for example, had no members of parliament. It was part of an enormous area represented by one member of parliament. And also, there, but in other places, there was a tiny village with just a couple of farmhouses, and they had two members of parliament. Um, so, so there was massive in, in, uh, inequality there. And they were arguing for annual elections for parliament. And, and Mill is largely for political reform, and and the political reform that we're seeing in Europe is is that countries should be governed not by the will of um, of some political leader, some king, but by the will of public opinion. But Pill, um, John Stuart Mill's reform here is to say, well, public opinion is all right, well, but that needs to be regulated as well. People shouldn't be forced to do stuff just because of public opinion. Public opinion should not be absolute. And if you remember, for Hobbes, it basically was um, absolute. For Locke, you could always um, overthrow um, your political uh, leader. But not even um, not even Locke had this idea whereby n no political... I mean, some things are just ruled out for political action. So that's the background of uh, On Liberty. It's a, it's a criticism of public opinion, even though public opinion is what is driving democratic reform. The second background is this: uh, is that John Stuart Mill's story is is a bit of a love story. He he starts his life as a real real nerd, uh, and he talks about his his crazy education. He's he learnt he learnt to read Greek before he learnt to read English. He learnt to read Latin really early. By the time he was by the time you you people would have started going to school, John Stuart Mill had already read Plato. Um, so he was he was a real nerd, and then he met this woman Harriet Taylor, um, who was married to another man. Uh, when he met her, so they were close friends, but it seems that nothing was going on um, for for twenty one years. And then um, her husband died, and two years later she married John Stuart Mill. Uh, but they only had eight years of marriage before she died. They sent essays to each other, and they spent a lot of time with each other. And even though it seems like they were um, fastidious when it comes to their relationships, um, it was a real scandal. There was a, this was a big um, problem from their friends. Um, and we have this uh, one. One of these friends uh, recalls, um, and and this is taken from the Spartacus uh, website that I referred to in the final, uh, in in your sources, which you'll find in the sources. He says that he, this is what how he reacted to the scandal. He says, My affection for Mill was so warm and so sincere that I was hurt by anything that brought ridicule upon him. I saw or I thought I saw how mischievous might be this affair, and as we had come as we had become in all things like brothers, 
I determined most unwisely to speak to him on the subject. With this resolution, I went to the Inder House next day and then frankly told him what I thought might result with his connection with Miss, Mrs. Taylor. He received my warnings coldly, and after some time I took my leave, little thinking what effect my remonstrances had produced. The next day I again called at the India House, and the moment I entered the room I saw that, as far as he was concerned, our friendship was at an end. So you can see that John Stuart Mill was clearly um, struggling with a great deal of public opinion being exercised towards him. Um, so you can absolutely see that yes is one thing he sees that philosophically and politically speaking we need to restrict all political power no matter how legitimate it may be. Even democratically elected political power needs to be restricted so that people have their own human rights. Um, but at the same time he's also basically saying I wish these people would get off my back about Harriet Taylor. Um, he was like I say a really moral person who knows what was going on with Harriet Taylor? I mean, he spent a suspiciously large amount of time with another man's wife, um, and um, and and he was clearly tired of being told off about it. And and this tiredness, I think, um, certainly expresses itself to a certain extent in um, in this uh, in this book on on liberty, where he objects to. Um, public opinion, where he says that yes, people should be allowed to just live with their mistakes. They may be wrong, they may be irrational. Let them live with it. Let us not intervene in people's in, in questions of truth, politically. Okay, let's get a little bit into some applications and criticism before we finish. Uh, the first application is in censorship, and of course, this is again an issue of of truth. And and John Stuart Mill has these biting criticisms of censorship, of the way polit politicians insist that you can't blaspheme in public, that you can't tell lies in, about God in public, that everybody who uh, wants to take part in political process needs to believe in a God, needs to believe in, um, in heaven and hell, um, because otherwise there is nothing to threaten them with. Um, and, and John Stuart Mill's arguments are there is a principle of scepticism. He... Um, he says, we, we simply don't know the truth. And here you can hear echoes of Descartes, of course. Um, we just don't know what is true about theology or anything, really. Um, and he refers back to the wars of religion and, um, and the, the tolerance which, um, which Europe decided to exert after the Thirty Years' War. He also talks about how if you're going to insist that everybody um, swears a Christian oath if they're going to take part in a legal trial, then uh, then there is a logical contradiction involved because you're saying that um, you you only want people who you know are going to tell the truth. Well, if somebody is going to lie, then they're going to lie when they swear an oath as well. So basically, the only people you're ruling out when you say that they have to swear a, swear a Christian oath is people who are so honest that they refuse to swear something that they don't believe in. And surely that kind of honesty is precisely the kind of person you do want in a legal trial. It's a beautifully formed logical argument. Um, and, um, and it talks very eloquently and very interestingly about truth and lies. The second thing is women's vote. And, and John Stuart Mill actually tried to, um, tried to get get women the vote in the 1800s and this is before all adults had the vote all adult men had the vote so he was extremely radical in this respect and this is definitely influenced by harriet taylor with whom um he uh, he he wrote the book the subjection of women one of the key um arguments for not giving women the vote in the 1800s was that women are stupid um women don't know and and that's also an argument for not giving all um all adult males the vote as well people who are not educated should not take part in politics now um, the other argument is that women are just not going to be able to or want to vote and John Stuart Mill says, okay, that's wonderful. In that case, politics doesn't need to intervene either. And this is why it's all of a key with his political liberal pro um, project. If women just shouldn't vote, it's not in their nature to vote, they can't vote, then don't forbid it. You know, if they can't do it, then we don't need to tell them off either. But it seems, it seems weird that we should have so much legislation, so many rules, so much policing of the vote, if there is genuinely no woman on this planet who actually wants to vote, then let's just leave things as they are and not make any laws about it. 
Again, his point is, of course, it's a slightly sarcastic point because he, you know, he think he sees that everybody knows that this is not the case about women's nature. It's obvious that they're not stupid, and it's certainly obvious that some of them want to vote at this point. Um, but his his immediate reaction is, well, let's not intervene. Political intervention is unnecessary. Okay, I want to put in a couple of um, arguments against John Stuart Mill because I worry because he just seems so logical. He's, everyone seems to agree with John Stuart Mill. One of the problems is that he argues a little bit too hard. Um, if um, if we really don't know um, enough to have a good basis for our political intervention, then really we should just stop having political intervention at all. If there is no such thing. Um, as good political intervention in censorship, we just don't know what to forbid people to say, um, then surely what is the basis of all our legislation? What is the basis of all politics? So he's basically arguing for anarchy there, and he he's not an anarchist. He definitely thinks there are a number of things that are perfectly okay with political intervention. And one of the things he says is in the last book of On Liberty is that police is okay. It's okay to try and prevent crime. It's okay to punish crime, that's fine. But it's also okay to try and prevent crime, and that seems very morally problematic. Why would you actually intervene in um, in somebody's life before they even actually manage to do any harm? Um, and it raises all sort of issues, the kind of issues that are raised in the film Minority Report with Tom Cruise. So go and watch that movie and you'll see what, why John Stuart Mill has got some problems. And the final problem is, of course, that he only, he only um, let, makes requirements about one end of somebody's life. If somebody is blossoming, flourishing as a, as a citizen, then, um, then they're leaving, leading a very successful life. Leave them alone. He says you shouldn't um, you shouldn't intervene. What he doesn't say about what are, what about people who just don't manage people at the complete other end of the scale don't manage to be happy. He has no idea of welfare, and of course, welfare will necessarily involve intervention in someone's life, finding out when they're um, having trouble, finding out when what we can do about their lives, um, finding out when somebody is abusing somebody else, and discovering and uncovering um, instances of abuse. And um, and it's curious that he doesn't want to that want the government to intervene in this case because he um, specifically because he knows so much about the subjection of women. Um, and it's a big disappointment for me in John Stuart Mill's work is that he's forever talking about laws about women and saying we need to stop having all these laws about women, but he doesn't address in any way the massive uh, problem of abuse of women which was um, both institutionalized in um, the industrial age, but also institutionalized in family life in the 1800s. And had he thought that, then he perhaps would have argued for more intervention in people's lives, more protection. And that is a, um, a moral problem, I think, for John Stuart Mill. Here are the, um, the sources I've used, um, particularly Choose, he, he's wonderful because he writes really short books. So choose one of these books, On Liberty, Utilitarianism. I don't really care which one you read, uh, but obviously On Liberty is the central one, which is going to be relevant for the syllabus. Thank you for listening.